Hello there, welcome back to Prof. Neil. It's a pleasure having you here. Tongue-tied serving Sir West Hall. Narrative for the day. Now the West Indians were the West Indies cricket team, but in India in 1983, after losing to India in the Kabil League finals of the 83 World Cup, Kabil lives Devils. I mean, I didn't you explain about that, but they had been humiliated as they felt. And this series was hence titled a revenge series. Now remember, the West Indians are professionals. They get bonus money for every win. And they had been promised big money after winning the 75 and 79 series. To win this 83 would have been three in a row. They would have taken home the potential cup. But they had been humiliated by India. So they wanted to show the upstart India a few lessons in their own backyard. A six test series and a five day, five one day as a series was planned already. So they came here and they completed this, they completely routed us. 3-0 test series and 5-0 one day international. Decimate, decimation means completely. It was a blackwash. The only two bright spots for the Indians were Sunil Gavaskar scoring 236 not out to become the highest Indian to score a, to become the second Indian to score, to become the only, the, the, the Indian batsman to score, the, I mean, to put up the, on the board, the highest score, after Vinu Mankad's score. So he broke a long-standing record. And with the century, he went past Sir Don's, Sir Donald Bradman's uh, record top tally of 29 test centuries. So not only really did he become the Indian to score the maximum number of runs in a test, test match in innings, he also broke Sir Donald Bradman's long-standing record of 29 test centuries. So that, and Kapil Dev, 9483 at Motera Stadium in Gujarat. It, it was went in vain. It was a brave effort. Single-handed, but it didn't work much. Because West Indies were in no mood to give away anything else. As the first year student in the Institute of Hotel Management at Ahmedabad, we were asked to report to the Hotel Kama where both the teams were dining in the evening. Standard practice when there's such events happen, the boys and girls from the catering college are called. The boys and girls benefit by serving, by waiting on such people. And uh, monetary also, and uh, the hotel pays them, and uh, we get a drop and pick up, etc. And the hotel gets labor for the evening. They don't have to hire extra staff. They get these boys and student girls for a uh, Part time, so just on the evening. That's a regular practice in the industry. Anyway, the majority of my class, all of us were delighted to have to, to meet the legends, to meet our cricketing heroes. But while the majority of my uh, coursemates were more focused on meeting and interacting with the Kapil Devs and the Gavaskars and the Richards and the Lloyds, I was more keen. Much I only had eyes focus only one person. The manager of the US Indies cricket team. What was special, what was special about him? He was Sir Wesley Hall, West Hall, the great fast Indian, West Indies fast bowler, who had played under Sir Frank Waddle, the first black captain, who unified the all the West Indian islands into one composite team, which helped benefited all the captains after him, including Clive Lloyd. Now that apart, Sir Frank Waddle being the first black captain, they he captained the team to 1960, 1962 Australia, the greatest ever Test series played in the in the history of the game, and also the first Test was the first tight Test, arguably the best ever tight Test. I mean, there were only two played till now, because it had bigger players, legends, Sir, Sir, Sir Sobers, Sir Waddle, Sir Hall, and there Richie Beno. Davidson, etc. A lot of big players. Only the second one. But good players, but not greats. Now, he, I had read about him so much that I had this, this image about him. And what I read, what I read, it proved out to be true because he was with all-time greats in history. And uh, he played in great number of matches and swung the game much in favor of the West Indies bowling. So there he was, as he came into the team, laughing away, chattering away, 
So it's there, broad shouldered, white shirt, maroon jacket, like everybody, that buttons open. And that crucifix of us showing clearly, shining at that distance from me. That's what I'm waiting for. He was a legend, six feet, two inches tall, very broad shouldered, built with a huge frame, and terrorized the from all over the world with his pace like fire, which was the title of his autobiography. His run up with the classical action almost started with from the boundary lines. You can imagine how much of terror he would have given to a Mental strength and uh, stamina were his characteristic straight traits. He could go on bowling, bowling again and again, hour after hour, with no sense of fatigue. A stock bowler and a strike bowler equally. But I've read also that Batman would get more terrorized and mesmerized by that crucifix bouncing on his chest. And he kept bouncing him and he came running in towards to bowl to them. And uh, Inadvertently, their feet would start moving towards square leg. That is a spell that crucifix, crucifix caused on them. So that, all that, and that built up over the last hole that he bowled in the tight test in Brisbane. He would have wanted to talk to him. His, what was going through his mind, in, at first hand, I, read, I mean, I've seen a lot of interviews on YouTube, but there's nothing like talking to the man person, exclusive, one to one. Now, to cut the story short, on that, on that last, the first test of the series, 1960, I mean, a series where uh, two brilliant captains, Richie Beno for the Australians and Sir Frank Worrell for the West Indies, on the final morning, Australia needed 233 runs in 310 minutes. A routine chase, but Hall, Hall Bowling had that lock, the top order. It was a routine chase, right? Because he was bowling with new boots which was causing blisters. But he went on and on. At the tea break, with Australia needing 124 in 300 and, in 120 minutes, with four wickets in hand, Sir Donald Bradman asked Richie Burn or the captain, what's it going to be? Richie said, we're going for a win. That pleased the legend. Now, 12 minutes to go, four wickets in hand, and seven, seven runs to win. Australia in command. A run out and unforced errors and brilliant fielding by the West Indies. It all boiled down to the last over. Remember, it used to be an eight ball over there in Australia. The Aussies had only one thing in mind put bat to ball and scamper for a single or more. Put the pressure on the West Indies. And like the West Indies had one thing common, so to field and throw to the stumps and back up to avoid all throws. So that was it. Now the last eight ball over, six runs required of that eight balls. Hall's first ball hit ground in the solar plexus. He was there, falling in the closet, crease, hurt and trying to find get his feet. But in the meantime, he saw Richie Bruno had traced down from the mid from the bowling crease up to the non-striker's crease to the batting batting crease. So he had no other option but to scramble for another single. He fell near the crease. He crawled into the safety of the crease just in time. Now, next ball, Beno was out, trying to hook. Hall, Hall disobeying his captain's orders not to bounce tail enders. With Beno gone uh, and the run taken, one run, the next man, Mekif, I mean, patted the ball back. Five runs required of five balls. Next ball, in the confusion that followed that the ball going through to Alexander, the wicketkeeper, the batsman scampered for a single. Now four runs of four balls. The pressure also on Hall. Remember, he was pulling the last tour of a test match, the first test match. The fortunes of five days, the fluctuating fortunes of five days of cricket, of good, tough cricket, hung in his hung in balance in his and the ball was in, in, his, in, a, in his hands and he was the key. Hall again disobeyed his captain by bouncing Grout who top edged, hooked and top edged. The ball hung in the air over the square leg. Now Hall is a right hand bowler. So with this run up he goes to the cover side. But 
to everybody, everybody's bewilderment, he ran opposite and went to square leg, where Kanai was, was taking, was standing at square leg to take a regulation catch. He had almost got his, the ball in his palms when Hall and all his enthusiasm elbowed him and tried to take the catch and the top ball dropped for him to then tell the umpire, the good God has left us, has left us all. And how Wes got there, I will never ever know, wrote for a later. In the melee, the batsman ran two, but lost a wicket trying to take the second. So one ball to go, finally. And Hall was nervous, not just by the, and perspiring not just because of the sun. One ball, one run to win. All that Hall was to do was save that one being scored. So Frank walks, walks across from to him from mid off. Wes, if you bowl a no ball now, they will never let you back in Barbados. Wes Hall, with all his tensions, was further tense with this. And this is much more bigger and tighter than a one day international or a T20 pales in comparison. If you can imagine five days of tough cricket and it boils out to the last over and the last ball. You can imagine how pressurizing it can be. The last ball witnessed a straight ball from Hall, hit to mid-wicket and uh, a straight throw hitting the stumps when the batsman trying to scramble for a skim single that elusive winning run. But and uh, they thought there was a run, so the, the umpire declared him out. The Australians celebrated, thinking they had won. The Australians morose, they had lost a close one. But it was a tied match, the first ever tight cricket test match in history, and the best ever. Sir John Bradman congratulated. Uh, Richie with congratulations Richie in cricket history. Richie, a typical Australian captain. Who wants to create history? We all to win. Now serving Sir West Hall, his rum and coke, I was humming under my breath, which he which I thought he would hear, and I wanted him to hear. My start to break that suspense with him. I was singing, humming the song Rum and Coca Cola. A typical Indian song and he looked at me and smiled and uh, like I think maybe imagining and thinking why how come this 18 year old boy in the small little city singing the song but that made a smile I thought I had got my breakthrough now I was about to talk to him ask him what that last over his what went through his mind what was going through his mind that time and then I my eyes spotted that crucifix at close range, and I was mesmerized. Like all the other batsmen, he was bowling to him. I know what would have happened to him. That Christus had a certain, not a sinister, but a certain presence about it that created a little bit of awe. Not fear for me, but awe. For the batsman, yes, fear. And in the presence of the hero of the first tied test, he, I got tongue tied. The opportunity of a lifetime was lost. I would never get that opportunity again in my life. Lessons. I'm going home, I was kicking myself for losing that opportunity. So that I, I but I realized that one thing that I had to do was to not fix it, but to make up. The next time I interacted with Vijay Amartraj at Western Hotel at the reception counter, I asked him, I said, Vijay, could you tell me? Sitting here, I was sitting in Ahmedabad, small little city on BBC radio, listening to how you played Connors. Oh, and he smiled, though he had lost that match. He smiled, and he, because he was up by set, up by games. Also, he was about to win that match, and then he lost from there. A series of errors. But he made history for himself and for India in Wimbledon. And he, that great man, explained to me. In detail, which is another video up sometime earlier, I had done this earlier. So I realized that 
the human beings, they, 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 they don't look down on you, most of them. And what is I asking? But don't regret later. Likewise with Geet Chetty. Even though it's my school alumnus, my previous video, I asked him, would you like to meet me? In, would you like to meet me in Madras, Chennai? I said, yes. I mean, you'll be surprised. People say yes. People do answer your queries. Then when you're not there, you say, I was not there. It was a great thing you did. What was your... So I learned from that. Now, when I do my motivational speaker sessions, I use this as, as a, in the language that the youths understand. I tell them, at the most, kya hoga? But don't regret later. And I use that example of the typical youth example that they understand. Teenagers is the example. Medicine teenager is here. At the most, kya hoga? We'll have a girl propose to her, damn it. At the most, kya hoga? What will happen at the most? She'll slap you. She'll say no. She won't kill you. Jaan to nahi legi na. So go ahead and propose. 30, don't after two, three decades down later, when you meet her at an alumni meet or at some function, and she's in a bad marriage, and you've been through a stormy relationship, or broken up, or single or whatever, widowed or whatever, and, and you're anchorless, she's anchorless, and she looks at you with those eyes, which you mesmerize, right? At that time, don't regret. Because if you propose to her, and she says no, you're finished, depressed. But if she says yes, and you get married, you're completely finished. Now that's your choice. Is it to be finished or to be completely finished? And then one more thing I realized is that they, I saw Clyde Lloyd, the missionary's captain, and Westfall talking to a young Indian cricket batsman, a very promising Indian cricket batsman, who was scoring 30s, 40s, 50s and getting out. He, he had a good potential. And they were advising him, an opponent, an adversary, who was playing the same series against them on how to make use of the second wind. I realized life has got but nothing more than just keeping your knowledge to yourself. You've got to share with the opponents and sports is the finest platform for that. So at the tender age, I realized that that was the lesson. So please go ahead and share your knowledge with anybody and everybody. Die empty, in other words. Embrace a twist to enjoy the turn. Thank you.